Hi, I'm Nick Malowick, and welcome to An Evil Mind, a crime fiction video blog from Xenobooks. Uh, today, due to uh, popular demand, for lack of a better term, uh, from our YouTube commenters, uh, I'm going to talk about Richard Stark and uh, the Parker novels. Uh, first thing you need to understand is uh, Richard Stark, not a real person. It's a pen name, one of many, uh, of course, by the noted crime author Don Westlake. Um, Westlake described it as, on sunny days, he was Don Westlake. On rainy days, he was Richard Stark. And he would, uh, for, for a couple of decades almost, you know, he would ping pong between the two personae, along with other pen names. I, there, and uh, he had a, a, a private eye series under the name Tucker Co for example, uh, that ran, I think, five or six books. But the uh, the Parker novels, and that is the character's sole name. He is mononymic, like Spencer. Uh, the Parker novels start in 1962 with The Hunter. Now, you have seen uh, The Hunter adapted twice. First, as Point Blank with uh, uh, Lee Marvin in 68, uh, and I think that's uh, John Borman's first American movie. And then again as Payback, with Mel Gibson. We'll come back to that one uh, in a couple of minutes. And when uh, he starts off with that, originally at the end of that book, Parker dies. And um, it's about, you know, it's about Parker taking revenge on his ex-wife and a partner who ripped him off uh, after, a, after a heist. And uh, he originally died at that, but his editor said that he would buy the novel only on the condition that Parker lived so that they could do a series of novels about him. And so they did. And they ran from 1962 to 1974, the very last one, Slayground, uh, which is something of a diehard prototype, where after uh, you know a, a robbery goes right, but the getaway goes wrong, Parker, uh, one of his partners, Alan Grofield, more about him in, in a couple of minutes, uh, and a third man get into a car crash in their getaway car. Parker is forced to go into an amusement park where he's being hunted not only by the town's corrupt cops, but by a group of uh, mafia goons who want the money that he has with him. Um, and from then, 1974 until 1997, nothing. And then 97, the Parker books start coming back again. Now, to be... Totally honest, in my view, they were not the same. And it was kind of like when Mickey Spillane took years off to, uh, to you know, to observe. He was a Jehovah's Witness after the first six uh, Mike Hammer books. And really only came back to those due to you know, pressing financial need. Pressing financial need was not an issue for Don Wesley. He wrote dozens of books and hundreds of short stories. Very successful. Again, a post-pulp writer, but starts off doing paperback originals in the 50s. Um, you know, and, and also there was there was a big enough crime short story market, even in the 50s and even up into the 60s, that uh, he did, you know, well for, a, you know, for a freelance writer, certainly, you know, and, and certainly astonishingly well by modern standards. Um, Westlake also did a series of novels about a, a burglar, um, and those are the Dortmunder books, which have also been adapted in various ways and various times. And actually, I want to do a separate Don Westlake podcast, podcast vlog just to uh, talk about those. Uh, but back to Stark. So yeah, they come out in 97, and those go through to 2008. And um, after that, Westlake died, uh, unfortunately, of a very sudden heart attack. And uh, there was no more after that. Like I said, the, the post-97, I still say this like I say about a lot of things, the post-97 Parker books are certainly worth reading, but they're not the same. They don't have the same energy to them. Uh, Westlake was writing the, you know, the, the original cycle of Parker books in the 60s and 70s. He was a much younger man. And Parker himself was a very different character. Um, and to, what about Parker's character? Uh, put quite simply, he is a he he's a sociopath. Parker doesn't really have redeeming qualities, except insofar as he does have his own peculiar brand 
of honor. Um, if such a thing as honor among thieves exists, Parker is one of the few men in his universe who has it. What Parker does is often uh, act as if he's not an active member of a heist, he will also contract sometimes to plan them. Of course, obviously, because it's a book, he always gets dragged into the heist as an active member. Um, but he will play the game of crime straight with his partners on a job if they'll let him play the game of crime straight. Now, of course, if that happened, there wouldn't be any books. So, you know, the complications with a heist always ensue in these books and frequently have to do with Parker having to revenge himself upon a betrayer or recover the money, you know, from someone who, who has, has stolen him. Sometimes that's a civilian. Uh, sometimes it's a dirty cop. Sometimes it's somebody within his own gang. Uh, you know, an example of this would be the novel, uh, which I think is like the eh, fifth or sixth in the series, the seventh, um, which was adapted into a movie with Jim Brown as the uh, protagonist. Interesting thing about Parker movies, the name Parker is never used for any of the characters in movies um, that are adapted from these books. It was one, it was the thing, part, Westlake would sell the books, he would not sell the character's name uh, when they were adapted into other media. The one exception to this are the Parker uh, graphic novel adaptations uh, by Darwin Cook. He saw those, he liked it enough, uh, and he he allowed Cook to actually use Parker's name. Well, Parker's often known by a variety of other names, such as, say, Porter and Walker. Um, and um, well, I can't remember what the one is they use in the uh, in the outfit, which is Robert Duvall and Joe Don Baker, uh, which is a very interesting. It's not especially faithful to the uh, books that it, from which it is adapted, but it's interesting in that it displays a sort of loosely affiliated ring of oaky criminals. So anyway, the outfit, uh, 74. At any rate, like I said, worth watching because the weird thing is in it that almost everybody in the film who's an independent heister or works in an associated trade seems to be some sort of Dust Bowl uh, refugee. It's, it's hard to find. Uh, last I looked, it was only available commercially through Warner Archives DVD on demand. Uh, and uh, to be polite about it, screw that. Uh, but Turner Classic runs it every so often, so keep an eye out for it. Um, a lot of the other Parker movies are also difficult to find. Uh, well, again, Turner Classic is your best source for it. There's a couple of them um, that were French ones, uh, French adaptations that were produced without license. And, and uh, one of them is not even uh, legally allowed to be distributed in the United States. But we were talking about uh, Parker's character a, a, a little bit. Like I said, he does have his own form of honor, uh, but you know, if you cross him, he is absolutely relentless and brutal uh, and will take not a dispassionate revenge, but a, a fairly passionate one for him. He he's, has a, a, a real lack of affect, but that doesn't stop him uh, from enjoying his work in certain circumstances. And I was talking about Slayground a little bit ago, too. So he's got one of his partners, Alan Grofield, is in that car crash with him. Slayground is an interesting novel in that at that point, uh, the narrative diverges. The book Slayground tells us what happens to Parker after that car crash. But uh, Grofield, who was in several of the Parker books, actually had his own four-book uh, series of novels. And one of his books, I believe it's Sour Lemon Score, chronicles what happens to him after the car crash. They both make their way, in a manner of speaking, uh, out of it. Uh, Grofield, however, not on his own two feet. Um, the Grofield books, definitely worth reading uh, if you can find them. I'm pretty sure they're available. At least one of them is out through uh, Hard Case Crime. Um, but they're much lighter in tone. Uh, than the Parker books. Still still violent. Um, like I said, Parker does not live in a world of polite or uh, 
um, kind people even necessarily. Grofield is not the sociopath that Parker is. He's still not a great guy. Um, what I would say in summation is start with the hunter and roll on up through because there is series continuity. It's, it's going to, you know, every novel builds on every other. And Parker does slowly change. Like I said, he never really develops redeeming qualities except insofar as, like I said, his sense of honor. And he, um, in, in uh, what is it, the Rare Coin score, and it's uh, the book immediately after it, which I think is Green Eagle score. Um, he doesn't fall in love, but he has a common law wife, uh, Claire, who comes to live with him, sets up housekeeping in him, and gives him a permanent uh, base of operations. Because before that, Parker always stayed in hotels between heists, and uh, he, he had a wife. Like I said, his wife betrays him in The Hunter, his first wife, uh, but there's no sense that he was ever actually in love with her, and uh, certainly the, the adaptations of the, uh, the, the two adaptations we see, uh, you know, also follow that logic. And as we're talking about adaptations, so The Hunter becomes, like I said, both point blank in 68 and I think it's 97, 98, 99, I can't remember, um, Payback with Mel Gibson. Now, two versions of Payback. The theatrical version is okay. The director's cut is outstanding and much more faithful to the book and is readily available. Hunt that up, watch that first. You can go ahead and watch the theatrical one later, but that is, you get into the business of like Mel Gibson's penchant for being tortured in films. There's none of that malarkey uh, in the director's cut. It's Brian Hegelin, who's the guy who did uh, L.A. Confidential. Not, no, not L.A. Confidential. Uh, that was Curtis Hansen. Anyway, get that one. Get the director's cut. Um, but, you know, I hope this has been a good introduction to the series. Um, like I said, heartily recommended. Again, the post-hiatus novels are lesser than. They're still good. They're still worth reading. But if you get up to Slay Ground and you've had enough of the bleak world of Parker, or as one website has it, the violent world of Parker, um, you can safely stop there. You will not have missed anything. Please subscribe to the channel. Uh, subscribe to notifications. Follow at Xenobooks on, uh, on social media. Uh, Facebook, Twitter. Um, I think that's it. It's, the rest of that doodah isn't worth really messing with. Um, you know, sales links for the books down in the description. Sales links for my books down in the description. That helps support uh, you know my existence and the continuation of the vlog. I want to thank the users who uh, commented on this and asked for a Richard Stark episode. Um, like I said, I got you know ideas for a few upcoming. You know, still need to do Elmore Leonard, still need to do Louis L'Amour, still need to do Don Westlake. But uh, thank you very much. Appreciate you watching, and we'll see you next week. Alrighty, bye.